Right, this project actually started out of um, a project that I have been involved in now for over a year, and I guess two and a half years if you go right back. It's a uh, 30 odd people led by a young woman who is the archivist at PLC. You may see Shannon Lovelady on TV. And we're trying to answer that question, how many from Western Australia died as a result of serving in, on the Western Front in World War I? Nobody actually knows. Nobody knew the Gallipoli one, and we finished that project and found that there were 1,023 West Australians who died as a result of their service in Gallipoli. But of course, to do a project like that, you have, or like either of these, you have to make some definitions, such as who counts as from Western Australia? Um, were they born here? Did they enlist from here? And so on. So the answer to that was yes. Um, if they had a, a close association from Western Australia, they are West Australian. Then how did they die? And, and many of them are killed in action, died of wounds and so on. There are um, died of illness, died of disease. And it, it comes up to 31st of August 1921. So we may have to research people who have come back 1918 or 1919, but who died and if their reason for death was attributable to their service on the Western Front, they are counted in. The RSL becomes the beneficiary of our entire database when we finish, and we've got uh, probably a three or four hundred word story on each person. We have an open Facebook site, so if you want to follow it, you can. There's a, a gentleman in France following it, and he keeps going around to every grave site he can find and photographing West Australian graves and posting pictures for us. Now, I became interested early on in the piece when I had a couple of West Australian airmen um, as part of my list to, to research and um, get all of this information on. And that set me uh, wondering how many more um, West Australians had actually died um, in aviation-related accidents um, during World War I. I wasn't quite sure what I was looking for there. So I had to do a bit of research around it, and of course they'd either be with the Royal Flying Corps, the Royal Naval Air Service, the Australian Flying Corps, which had only four squadrons anyway, or later on the Royal Air Force. <coughs> Interestingly, um, in reading their history, trying to get their rank, um, early on of course they were all army ranks, because flying was just uh, an addition to um, any of the army units. But later on, um, we certainly had uh, pilot officers. Uh, observers, now observer was a, a particular role and an observer was usually a gunner as well, um, uh, the second person on the aircraft. They had to do exams to get to be that. A mechanic or an armourer um, and a photographer. And these are so far the only ones who have I, I have identified. There were not many West Australians who died in as a result of their service in World War I, I'm not restricting it to the Western Front. Um, I am well through some of them and I have got sketchy details on others. If you have any information on any of those, I would be really interested, um, uh, particularly trying to collect photographs and so on, which can be quite difficult. What I would like to do as part of this talk is simply to focus on three of them, the three I've asterisked, to try and compare, contrast their experiences. They're chosen for a reason. Um, it doesn't mean to say the others are less important or have less interesting stories. There's some fascinating stories amongst each of these people. So my first one is Lieutenant or Second Lieutenant Charles Percy Long. That's the best photograph I can find of him, and it's drawn from the photograph below. He was a member of the Guild of Undergraduates at UWA. Now, he was actually born in Victoria. His parents married the day uh, before he was born, which is very forward for about 1892 or 93. Um, but they already had three children, so he was their fourth. 
Um, I haven't yet dug well into that, but I think there's a story there. So they came to WA about 1902 and 3. They were in Albany for a while and then settled into Kings Road in Subiaco. And that's the house. It is still there. It was actually owned by the older son and um, the father, who was also Charles Percy, was a, an accountant for WA Trotting Association. So he wasn't short of a bob or two. Um, but young Charles Percy uh, enrolled as an engineer to become an engineer at UWA. And at part time, he was also a surveyor and worked on the uh, Morgan Hills Mullawa Railway. He was obviously a very bright young fellow. He received a scholarship and he was a member of the Kings Park Club, which was more than just tennis at that stage. It was quite a major uh, thing to belong to. He actually enlisted in the AIF, and that's reasonably unusual. Um, he, he wanted to, he, he got his commission, but his appointment with the AIF was terminated because UWA stepped in and actually organised for him to join or use his commission with the Royal Engineers. So he headed off to England and actually fought with the Royal Engineers in um, on the Western Front. They are British things, uh, battles we don't hear that much about, La Boiselle and Tipval. And then at some point transferred to the 46th Squadron Royal Flying Corps as an observer. Now, the 46th Squadron was formed at Witten Aerodrome in April 1916, so we're fairly early on in the war. Um, and he was with the number two reserve squadron. Now, the reserve squadrons were the training squadrons. And it moved to France in October 1916, equipped with the Newport 20 aircraft, which were built primarily from the Newport 12s, uh, with a, a different engine, and they were built primarily for the Royal Flying Corps. So it had a Rhone engine, or Le Rhone engine, instead of a Clojet engine. There weren't that many of them built. Now, this young fellow was flying on the Western Front. Uh, he was an observer, he wasn't the pilot. And in April was the period in which um, there was a major offensive uh, to try and take part of the um, uh, German line uh, at around uh, Bullecourt and those regions. Now the Australians were at Bullecourt but the British and the Canadians were all up and down that line trying to get through, trying to break through. And so on the 13th of April he was probably in one of these situations of flying over um, looking, observing, and then coming back and reporting on the position of um, the, the enemy. Unfortunately, um, they were attacked from the rear by um, uh, another, by two aircraft, and this was in the area of um, Ypres, and he got back as far, uh, he, was, he was shot, he was trying to clear apparently the gun which had um, uh, jammed after about a quarter of a turn and in trying to do that he was shot in the neck and the pilot once he realised turned around and immediately landed at Abili aircraft, uh, at Abili aerodrome which is this one up here so it's not that far from Ypres. When they landed, um, Lieutenant Long was actually dead. So he is classified as killed in action. Um, the pilot did survive, uh, but later died as a POW. Now, he's buried, Charles Long is buried at Lysenhoek Military Cemetery in Belgium. He was only 24 years old. But I noticed that his parents actually sailed for London later that year. And I also noticed that this gravestone of Charles Long and his father is in Karakata Cemetery. So I'm not sure whether his parents brought back um, his body or not, but I, they certainly went over with the intention uh, of doing something like that. So that's our first young man who died in World War I. This second young man um, 
with the very fascinating name of Alaric Pindabor. He's got quite dark features, and I actually wondered whether the name was Indian or part Indian, and I did dig into his family. He wasn't able to confirm that. But I found that his father was orphaned at a very young age, uh, but came out to WA um, in about 1892, married here, and that's his, that's Alaric there, and his father, mother, and it's four younger sisters. They, the family, or his father owned a drapery business in Perth, and then after the turn of the century in Carnarvon, and then about 1915 moved to Bunbury. It was known as Boar's Drapery Service, and I know in Carnarvon it was also the picture theater. Now, Alaric went to Christian Brothers College, and that was, if you like, the precursor of Aquinas, and much of this information has actually been gathered by the archivist at, um, at Aquinas College. He was a very, very bright young man. He excelled at sport, boxing, photography. He played football for East Perth and Subiaco in what was the precursor, if you like, of the waffle. And he was WA's road scholar for 1913. That puts him as the top student in Western Australia in 1913. So he duly went off to Brasenose College, which was one of the colleges at Oxford, which may have been good, but may not have been good, because Brasenose College became the site of, um, or the location of the number two um, flying training school, if you like, of the um, uh, Royal Flying Corps. That photograph there shows some of his 130-odd medals, I believe, and so on. Noted that a number of those boys never came back. Now, I thought I'd just digress for a second into pilot training. Now, this is the World, this is the Australian Flying Corps syllabus. I couldn't find a copy of the, the um, Royal Flying Corps, but Generally, they were at the number two school at Oxford. It was a six-week course, terrific. Uh, obviously, lectures and exams and so on on those sorts of topics and practical. An examination, if you get through the examination, you can then go and do your flying. Three to five hours uh, dual, and then you've got to do your 20-hour solo. So it's a fairly basic um, amount of flying training and the sort of things you had to do in those sort of uh, very flimsy aircraft. Now, when war broke out in September 1914, the students at Oxford and Cambridge were strongly encouraged to take their commission. And Alaric wrote home to ask his father if he could enlist, but before the response even came, Alaric was in. And he enlisted with the uh, 7th Battalion Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. And he headed off to France. And he did uh, send back a few letters describing his experiences in France. They call them Cook's Tours. They'd send the young officers out for two weeks. Um, and they would go and um, basically be on the front line for a, a couple of days and back behind the lines for a period after that. Then. Interestingly, he saw service in Salonika. This was Serbia in 1914, completely landlocked. And the Germans came down there, the Bulgarians came there, and the Serbs were driven down. Now, that would give Germany, of course, uh, a link right through to the um, Mediterranean Sea. So it was considered important to stop that um, attack coming through. And so across this area here, from Salonika through to here was a massive line of trenches. And during about three years, there were over 600,000 troops fighting there at various times. French and English and, um, of course, the Serbs. If you want to read some fascinating histories, there are also some Australian women who fought for Serbia at that time, doctor, ambulance, driver, and so on. Now, he, he fought there, and there is a, a fascinating um, description. He wrote back to his parents, 
I'm alive. God has been good to me. I've been in hell for four days with only five hours sleep. It's all been one tremendous nightmare. And he describes some of his experiences, which um, I won't go through. Now, he, not long after that, applied to become a pilot. I think he didn't like the um, ground warfare very much. So, in, on 2nd of April 1917, it was gazetted that he would, was a flying officer. So he undertook the flying training that was in England, but then he was posted to the Middle East with one 13 Squadron Royal Flying Corps. Now, the Royal Flying Corps in the Middle East, of course, was primarily involved in this reconnaissance, going forward and back and forward and back, trying to work out the location of the Turks, the location of um, the Arabs to some extent, a bit of photography, bombing, and so on. And Alaric was uh, the pilot on these RE-8 aircraft, which didn't have a particularly good reputation, I understand. Now, he actually died on a very, very uh, auspicious occasion, if you like. 31st of October 1917, which was uh, the Battle of Beersheba, or the Charge of the 4th Light Horse Brigade. At that day, he was doing reconnaissance, so taking off, flying over, and the observer actually took notes, wrote them on a bit of paper, wrapped them around a rock, he flew back over the lines, dropped his report, and they went on and like that. I mean, the communication was a note around a rock. <laughs> at about 10.30 a.m., however, he crashed at El Bakar, um, which was one of the British um, bases. The reason for the crash is not known. Um, his CO did write home to his parents, and I have a copy of that letter, but primarily it, it was thought to be a lo loss of control. It may also occur to me um, uh, out of fuel because they were going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards a quite bit. Now, they were pulled from the wreck. Um, uh, now the observer was dead and Alaric lived for about another half an hour or something. Um, so he, it's, as far as he's concerned, he died of wounds because he didn't die instantly, and so that's how it would be classified. He's buried in Beersheba War Cemetery, and I quite like the epitaph that his parents asked to have put onto his um, headstone. Last one I'd like to mention today is um, John, Dun John Leonard Dunstan. I did find a beautiful photograph of him, and we do find occasionally really good photographs. That's actually in the Imperial War Museum, and it's in his uh, Royal Field Artillery uniform. He, he got around a fair bit this one. He was a gunner, an observer, and a pilot. But interestingly, he's a fellow who died of illness. I'm fascinated by this man's background. Um, John and Margaret Dunstan, born in Port Adelaide, and he had three sisters, again like Alaric, the oldest son, oldest and only son. Now his father was a metallurgist and came to WA, um, actually set up the Marin Marin um, copper smelter and then ended up as a superintendent of bat state batteries in Kalgoorlie. So again, another family very well to do um, with a very, very talented son. Now, his first school was out here, which fascinated me, then Brown Hill in Kalgoorlie. And then for a period he went back to um, Port Adelaide, um, received scholarships there, but came back to Perth and studied at Scotch College and Perth Technical uh, School. Brilliant, brilliant sportsman. He also played uh, league football, waffle football, if you like. Now, this student was twice nominated as a Rhodes Scholar, didn't get it either time. The first time, another student got it, and it was he was nominated by Scotch. The second time, he was doing two units or two subjects at um, Perth Technical School, I think, uh, a physics unit and uh, an inorganic chemistry unit that he couldn't do um, at Scotch. So um, Perth Technical School nominated him. However, they said, oh, no, you're only doing two subjects there, so you can't be it. Now, the Sunday Times was absolutely incensed by this, and you can see it. Another of the Hackett clique appointed. 
it was considered that the person who beat Alaric was Archbishop Riley's son, um, who was called Basil Riley, was given it instead. So the Sunday Times and its people were so incensed, they actually raised 900 pounds to send him to Oxford anyway, where he was duly travelled over with Archbishop Riley and his son. <laughs> Now, while he was studying, he was with, as, as all of them did, they seemed to have a, um, a service at the time, King Edward's horse. And he was very interested in, in uh, cavalry anyway. In 1914, he enlisted with uh, what he hoped was a cavalry unit, um, and again applied for a commission as they all had to do. He then joined the uh, artillery group and was off to France again, like Alaric, on these Cook's tours. He also was sent to Salonica, but this time he was actually attached to the French Flying Corps. Now the French Flying Corps were the ones doing the aerial reconnaissance um, over Serbia. And he was an observer and a gunner. Um, but this area of Salonica was apparently really damp and mosquito ridden and like a lot he got malaria so he was off to Malta to recover. Now he actually wanted to get back to England but for some reason he sent to learn to fly but he went to the third school of our military aeronautics which is in Abakia in Egypt. So the British, I would think, probably because of weather and because they really need a lot of pilots, needed a third school of military aeronautics and they actually created one in Egypt. It was initially at Abu Kir, then Abbasir and then Heliopolis. Now, this is not our young friend, but I did find the photograph, which is the only photograph I could find of Abu Kir. And it was actually taken by a mechanic um, there. So, not sure the cause of that accident, but there is Abu Kir. So, the aircraft used for basic training at Abu, Abu Kir was this most flimsy looking thing here. Um, well, that was by um, the really ab initio pilots. Um, uh, uh, John Dunstan started on these because he'd been doing a little bit of training. The number two, 22 reserve squadron were flying these and then moved to those. Now, he did become a pilot. He was gazetted as um, being in the Royal Flying Corps, but he was actually gazetted in November 19... October it was gazetted that he was a pilot officer. He was transferred to the Royal Flying Corps 1917, and by December 1970, just one month later, he wrote home to say he was resting in England. And I uh, found that he had an accident. I do not know the details of the accident. However, he um, apparently could no longer fly. So something happened in that month and I'm not sure where it was. I'm still trying to dig that one out. So he went back to England, March 1918, resigned his commission and went to back to study medicine. Unfortunately, in the hospital, six months later, in treating patients with Spanish flu, he actually caught it himself and he died. So I found this copy of the hospital journal and a little description here that says, Surgeon Sub-Lieutenant T. Carlisle and J.I. Dunstan both succumbed in hospital to pneumonia following influenza. And he is therefore buried at Highgate Cemetery in London. So, three young men, brilliant scholars from well-to-do families, went away to World War I, none of them with the intention of flying, all ended up in flying and lost their lives as a result. Uh, buried in different places, but all of them would have to be considered such a, a terrible loss to WA at that time in its history, losing three fellows who could all have been Rhodes Scholars. Thank you.